and it's definitely shaped what, how I think my career is going to go from here on out. Um, conferences and meetings. So that's another important point. So you guys will start going to a lot more of these um, once you're in F1, once you're in F2, not only to present your own work, but also to get sort of points for your CV, to listen to people talking about a specialty you're interested in. And often when you're on clinical jobs, so throughout my F1, I didn't have any academic time. I was on my clinical jobs. If I wanted to go to a conference, I had to apply for study leave. And it's really, really difficult to get study leave if you're if you have normal clinical commitments. Now my block, my time is my own and it's protected time. So if I want to go to a conference, people actively encourage it and I can get my study leave quite easily. So it's a nice thing. It's a nice sort of part of the job. Exposure to certain specialties. So this is a big thing that I haven't even mentioned yet. So going back to how I, the sort of structure of an AFP, I mentioned that, um, in a normal foundation program, you have six jobs spread across two years. When it comes to choosing your foundation program jobs, you actually only know what jobs you're doing quite late on. So initially you apply to a deanery, then you apply to the hospital, and then you apply for the jobs. And so you don't know until pretty much like finals or just after finals, um, what jobs you're actually going to be doing for the next two years. With an academic foundation program, you know all six jobs that you're going to be doing before you even apply. So all the deaneries have already published the list and the, the newsletter that we sent out as part of our mailing list has the links to all the sort of job lists for each deanery. So you know the six jobs that you're going to be doing and you'll know exactly which specialties those are in. So even if you're not necessarily interested in the academic block or the academic specialty, if you want exposure to another specialty, you can definitely get that through an AFP. An example is, um, for example, I, I'm interested in transplant surgery. So one of the AFPs that I applied for was the Cambridge um, Surgery AFP, which had two transplant surgery blocks within it. Um, neurosurgery, plastic surgery, pediatrics, all these other specialties often are very difficult to get through the normal foundation program but actually with an academic block, they come ready prepared as part of the other six things as well. You get a taste of your potential career path without sacrificing extra time. So um, one of the things is that when you're in F1 and F2, and you don't have to have any idea of what specialty you wanna do, I change sort of every week. I think everyone else on the MedIQ team change pretty regularly as well. But in order to explore what specialty you want to do, you often have to sacrifice your own time. So you have to stay after work or go on a taste a week and use up your annual leave, et cetera. It's quite difficult if you're on a normal foundation program to explore other avenues in terms of careers. Whereas again, because of the protected time that comes with an AFP, you have the time to go off and taste a week. You have the time to go off and shadow in theater once a week, et cetera. So it's a really good opportunity to do that as well. Another big thing is that it's a free shot at the deanery that you want to be in. So when you're applying for a foundation program, you rank the deaneries that you want to uh, apply to. When you're applying to an academic foundation program, you pick two deaneries you want to apply to. You can match up sort of your top deaneries and actually get two shots at applying to your top deanery. And actually, I think that's probably the, one of the biggest reasons to even apply for an AFP as well. In addition to all the stuff I've talked about, if location is your main sort of thing, this just gives you two chances to get into the deanery and add not much extra effort of applying. You get a lot of application and interview experience. So for a lot of us, the last interviews we would have had would have been when we were doing our medical school interviews, which is quite a long time ago. And since then, we've probably done a fair bit, but haven't actually thought about it or haven't had anyone question what we're doing and things like that. So actually preparing for an AFP interview or an AFP application means that you'll get your portfolio in shape and it's ready for sort of the next stage of application so your core surgical application your gp application etc it just sort of it just sort of puts it in your mind that you've got all this stuff ready to go when you approach those next levels of application um i'm going to pause for a second just to see if anyone has any questions about any of that um if anyone does just raise your hand or post in the chat Cool. All right. I am doing perfectly, apparently. So cool. <laughs> All right. These are just some quotes um, that I got from the AFP like booklet about why people want to do an AFP in the first place. It's a lot of stuff that I've already talked about. So knowing about medical research, being a better teacher, getting specialty exposure, 
or being interested in business and management. So if any of those things are sort of twigging that you, you kind of want a little bit of that or a little bit of this, definitely an AFP is something to consider applying for. I thought it'd be useful just to run through what the hell I actually do on a day to day in my AFP. A lot of people ask me this um, because you're not timetable to do anything. How do you actually fill your time? Um, and so I thought it'd be useful just to run through. So I'm on a medical education block. So I thought I'd talk about what I actually do on a day to day basis. Um, so for me, it's sort of split into two or three main areas. So I split it into undergraduate education. So typically I um, get up commute in um, and I sort of stroll in at about half nine to the teaching fellow office, which is quite a lush office. Um, that's another thing about an AFP, you usually get your own office space somewhere in a hospital and your own computer and stuff. So it's quite nice, you get your own little space. Um, so I stroll in at about half nine. I go to apologize to someone for being late and no one else is even here yet. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, so, uh, I, yeah, so no one else is even here yet. So it's a pretty chill start to the day. Um, then typically on the undergraduate side, I'll meet with the teaching fellows or I'll meet with the site dean. Um, so Royal Free Hospital is attached to UCL Medical School um, with the person who's in charge of sort of the undergraduate teaching at this site. And we'll sit down over a coffee and just discuss any sort of problems that have arisen either from the students on their placements or from the medical school itself. And we'll discuss sort of the things to organise. So this week, for example, we've had a lot of fourth and fifth year students join us. And so we've been organizing the introduction sessions for them. So organizing and teaching the examination sessions, vinopuncture, ABG sessions, and getting tutors together for all of this, making lesson plans and sending this out for everyone. Um, so we've just about finished all of that as of today. Um, teaching obviously takes up a huge part of a medical education block. Um, this is the thing I love the most about it. Um, I love teaching when I was at medical school and I still love doing it. Um, so actually the bulk of what I do with my time is teach um, a lot. A thing that I didn't think I'd be doing as much of is organizing. Um, I had no idea, number one, how much organization goes into all the stuff that we had at medical school. Um, and I know I, I, I complained a lot about teaching and placements and stuff being boring and things like that when I was at medical school. Um, and now being on this side of it, I've got a bit of an appreciation for how much work people actually put into it. Um, so a lot of the stuff I do is like timetabling activities for students. And again, I use my experience. I remember what was good, what was bad. Oh, actually going to theatre and standing there for four hours and not seeing anything isn't great. We should change that. So you get to use your experience and again, have a seat at the table where people are making decisions. Um, a lot of the things we're doing now is sort of designing and delivering teaching sessions in new ways. So using things like webinars, Microsoft Teams, um, a lot of simulation teaching. Um, and another side of it is lesson planning and using educational theory. So I get taught some educational theory from other teaching fellows in the department alongside the sort of postgraduate certificate that I've done where I learned a lot about educational theory and I get to apply a fair bit of that into actually practically making plans and actually making um, teaching like slides, etc. as well. And then there's the project side of it. So like I mentioned, I personally think like you should get something tangible out of doing an AFP. It's great having all these experiences and teaching and that's really useful. But at the same time, I'm trying to work towards getting something published or present somewhere as well. And so my project that I haven't really started working on, but I've told my supervisor I have, um, is sort of designing a surgical virtual module. So again, based on the fact that number one, students aren't going to be able to go into theatre as much anymore because of COVID. And number two, when you're there, you barely see anything anyway. My project idea is making an hour long video um, with sort of 10 minutes of it being actual recordings of surgery with key anatomy and stuff highlighted. And the rest of it is sort of patient journey for that surgery, for example. Um, that sounds, I guess, fairly simple, but the actual process of doing that involves doing a lit review, writing up a project proposal to my supervisor and the medical school, creating the actual content, which is a big side of it. Um, then afterwards, I'll have to focus groups, get some feedback from the students, and then eventually hopefully write it up and present it or publish it somewhere. And hopefully it then sticks on as a part of the undergraduate curriculum forever. We'll see. I need to start it. Um, then the other thing is the postgraduate side. So Again, I didn't know how much of this stuff I would be doing before I started. Um, it was a bit of a surprise to me, but I've really, really enjoyed it. 
Um, so a lot of it is, again, organizing teaching for foundation years and being a foundation year rep. Um, those sort of leadership roles, I probably never would have sort of gravitated towards unless I'd gotten to know people in the postgraduate team and unless I'd sort of become passionate about the style of teaching and the things that are going on within that team. Um, a big part of what I'm doing, again, surprisingly, is surge planning. So if there is a second wave for COVID, what are we going to do? And again, it's really nice to have a voice at that table where people are making these decisions, your opinions sort of heard and be able to represent your peers in making those decisions. Um, and again, I've got sort of a project going on in relation to learning. So this project is sort of designing an interdisciplinary simulation scenario. So again, in the first wave of COVID, we had a lot of doctors and nurses redeployed from area, acute medical areas. So pediatric outpatient nurses, um, neurophysiology registrars, etc. Um, and a lot of those people haven't done any sort of acute medicine for years. So my project is designing and teaching um, various simulation sessions for these people in order to prepare them for a second wave. Last thing is sort of just general other stuff that I do. So those first two things are sort of just what I could think of off the top of my head that I did yesterday and today. Um, and again, like I said, none of that is timetabled. I literally just turn up and some of these meetings are happening, some of them aren't. You just find stuff to do a lot of the time. But that's because I'm, I think, on a medical education block, which is maybe a little bit less structured than an academic sort of research post where you'll get given perhaps a research project to do, et cetera. So anyway, other stuff that's going on. So I have clinical days. So I spend a day a week shadowing um, or going into theater. Um, I'm trying to organize a taster week. Um, I've just sat an exam for surgical exam. Um, you have the opportunity to do non-med ed projects. A question I get all the time is, oh, do you have to do a medical education project if you're on a medical education block? No, you can do other stuff. It's protected time. You do what you want with it. Um, going out for sort of team meals and socials, it's a big thing. I, again, completely forgot about it, but as an F1, as an F2, in your clinical teams, you get quite close. And that doesn't, that's not different in an academic team. An academic team is just as social, it's just as nice, and you don't miss out on that side at all. Um, and it's just more time, I'm on a nine to five job, so it's just more time outside of medicine to do whatever you want as well. Does anyone have any questions about my day or anything like that? Again, um, message on the group or put your hand up. Um, I'll pause for a second. Okay, um, so moving on to sort of what you need and what you might not need in terms of actually applying for an AFP. So what do you need? You need to be passionate about an academic job, essentially. Um, you need a desire to want to teach or carry out research or be a leader and integrate that going on in your clinical careers. And I think that's what a big part of the interview is. In a lot of the deaneries, you'll have an interview where they'll ask you personal questions, just like you were at medical school. And the main thing is to get across that you really do want to be involved in these things, that you really do want to learn. And often the people that are interviewing you will be your supervisors or they will be someone's supervisors. They're all academic people who want to share their skills, share their knowledge. And it's about showing them that you're passionate about these things and that you want to integrate them into your future career. You need to have good clinical abilities. So that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I'm first decile. And that doesn't mean that if you're 10th decile, you can't apply for an academic block. The reason I put that point in there is because like I mentioned, some of your clinical time is taken away from you. And so uh, you, you have more time for academic stuff, but you have less time for clinical medicine. And our actual requirements are the same as any other F1 and F2 who are on the normal foundation program. So we just have to fit in all those sort of case-based discussions and things um, into our, the rest of our clinical blocks, um, which is not actually that bad. I'm sure you guys have sort of SLEs and case-based discussions to sign off. I have to do X number of taking blood, et cetera. If you find a nice SHO or registrar, they'll sign you off for everything pretty easily. So it's not that big a, a worry. But the thing to think about there is, oh, would you lose that sort of four months of clinical experience as well? You need to be able to sell yourself um, in applications and interviews. And that's something we're all characteristically pretty crap at as medics. We're all reasonably humble people. But hopefully over the next few weeks and when we go on to our interview course, we'll teach you sort of how to sell yourself, especially this year when a lot of your interviews will be done virtually and might not be in person. What don't you need? Um, so you don't need 400 publications. We'll do 
Um, I'm kidding. Um, that was a really bad joke that the others asked me not to do, but I still did it anyway. Um, and you don't need to be first SL for all six years. Like I said, you don't at all need to be the first person in your medical school for everything. It helps in some deaneries for points, but other deaneries don't necessarily look at it at all. You don't need a PhD. Like I said, the main thing about an AFP is that it's an introduction to all of these things. It's an introduction to research, an introduction to teaching. They don't expect you to already know how to run a randomized controlled trial. All of it is to pick up those skills and learn. You don't need any previous research or teaching experience or leadership experience. Again, it does help to have some things to talk about at your interview, but don't be worried if the things that I'm saying to you, you you're thinking to yourself, oh, I haven't done any of that. Number one, you still have a fair bit of time before the application process begins. And number two, it's all about showing that you're passionate about getting those skills, not necessarily demonstrating that you already have all of them and you're at the top of your game, because then you're not really getting much from doing the AFP. You don't need to know which specialty you want to do. Um, like I said, all of us literally change every other day what specialty we want to do, um, apart from Marinos, who's wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon since he was like four. Um, so everyone else, we're all, we all don't know what we want to do. You don't need to know. You have the time to go and explore these things. And especially with an academic block, you have four months or a few days a week to go off and explore these things. You don't need to have a supervisor already. And someone's just messaged me asking that question um, about, would you recommend we get a supervisor before we apply for a job? It's a really good question to ask. I personally, I never met my supervisor until the day I started my job. I kept emailing her for about a month before, two months before. She was just always on annual leave. Um, so I never actually met her. Some deaneries, when you go for interview, will ask maybe what research team you want to work with, what your research interests are. And in that sense, it might be good to have done a little bit of research or maybe message someone saying, oh, I'm interested in this. I might be applying for an academic job in a year's time. What sort of things do you have going on? What could I be involved with? But you don't at all necessarily have to go into your interviews and say, I'm going to be doing it with this person. They've already said yes, et cetera. Not at all. So don't worry about that. Um, I didn't contact anyone before my London or Cambridge interviews. Some people do, some people don't. Um, if if you have a clear idea about what you want to do, then sure, it's worth it. It helps things get things in motion, um, but otherwise, don't worry about it. Hopefully that answers your question. Let me know if it, if it doesn't. Um, so the other thing you don't need is a fully polished portfolio. Um, everyone always sort of worries about people bringing these like massive tomes of um, 30,000 pages of certificates and stuff like that. Um, I didn't have any sort of portfolio when I applied. I don't think most people do. I think someone at my Cambridge interview did and it really freaked out before my interview, but most people don't and they don't ask for it. So don't worry about that either. There are some downsides to the AFP to think about. And I thought I just mentioned the clear here. I'm obviously quite biased in that we're running a course that promotes the AFP, but I thought it's important for you guys to know this before you apply. And it's some things that maybe I didn't know when I applied and some things that I did, but I'll just, I'll share it with you guys now. So like I've mentioned, you get one less clinical rotation and you're still expected to meet all the same competencies as the other F1s and F2s. Um, I said, like I said, it's, I don't think that's a huge, a huge problem because you'll easily meet the competencies. It's not much you need to get signed off as an or an F2 um, to meet your competency. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. The way to think about that sort of negative is that you might get one less clinical block but then you can make it up by going on taste weeks, et cetera, or having a clinical day a week during your academic block. Might be a bit more slower paced. I, don't, I actually disagree with this. Um, I thought my med ed block would be like reasonably short, and it is, I, I, am, I am on a nine to five job. It is more chilled out than doing on calls and acute med or whatever. Um, but I actually am weirdly busy a lot of the time. I come to work expecting maybe not to do a huge amount, and then I'm busy until five o'clock, and I don't know where the time's gone. Um, so I maybe disagree with what I put there about it being slower paced. I think what I maybe was also getting at was that in terms of actually seeing a tangible outcome from it, so a presentation or a publication, it takes a long time. So four months, either a four month block or the year with the day release, it's not a massive amount of time to get your project done and publish it. It takes up to a year to sometimes publish things in itself. Um, and so you have to be prepared for that to be a bit slower. Um, it can be a bit difficult if it's your first time sort of leading a project. So like I mentioned, when you were at medical school, you might have just done an audit or just collected data and been a part of something much bigger. 
but this is your first chance to actually say i want to do this project i'm interested in this i have this idea and lead it yourself which can be really daunting because you i mean i just I'm, I'm just writing my project proposal now and i just have literally i've never done it before but my supervisor is so supportive we sat down yesterday for about half an hour and he literally just wrote out bullet point by bullet point what a structure of a project proposal should be gave me a framework for what to do a few papers to read and that's sort of the beauty of the AFP. You have someone who is so experienced supervising you personally. And so that's really sort of a big positive for me. Um, predetermined rotations, good or bad. It depends on what you like and what you don't like. Um, it is less pay. Your academic block is unbanded. So I earn maybe five or six, maybe well, not five or six, maybe about three or four grand less than the people who are sort of on an average F2 salary. But at the same time, you have more time off, so you can locum and make some money like that if you want to. Um, it's competitive, but not always, um, depending on the deanery. And just because it's competitive shouldn't be a reason why anyone doesn't apply. If you're here or you're interested and you're passionate, you stand a really good chance. Um, and hopefully, again, if you choose to sort of carry on coming to these webinars, then we'll prepare you even better and make you competitive as well. Ooh, balancing act. Um, yeah. Uh, basically you've got to balance clinical work academic work and your personal life i actually think to an extent that might be easier in an afp because you have sort of protected time you're working nine to five um but yeah i think i that, that's a slide about the negatives of the afp and i've sort of spinned spun every single one into a positive but anyway um has anyone got any questions about that Okay, in that case, Marinos is just going to jump in for a second. So he's our academic clinical fellow in cardiothoracic surgery, and he's going to talk to you guys for a second about sort of where an AFP can take you and what exactly the academic path is. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Marinos. So as uh, Vic has been uh, saying, the academic foundation program is more about developing the skill sets um, finding out whether research is right for you and uh, finding out what sort of research you'd be interested in doing. Those four months are too short a time for you to produce anything substantial. Uh, it's enough in most instances for you to become a better researcher, academic um, leader or uh, educator. Then uh, once you've decided that you want research to be part of what you do for the rest of your life, and uh, once you've started getting into some sort of specialist training, uh, then there's an opportunity to get into an um, academic clinical fellowship, that's the ACF. Um, this is slightly different in that you it runs for uh, three years. Um, get 75% time clinical, 25% uh, time for research. And the point of an ACF in general is that you develop both the skills but also the research output to be able to secure funding for a competitive uh, clinical research fellowship, training fellowship to be able to do um, a PhD or an MD. So the point of the ACF is to uh, help you develop as a researcher, whereas the academic foundation program is more as a taster or a stepping stone. Then, say you've decided uh, that uh, you want research to be a substantial component of what you do as a senior registrar or as a consultant, and then you can apply for an uh, academic clinical lecturer post, which is another um, uh, part of uh, the integrated academic training pathway, where you get 50% time clinical, 50% time in research, that's after you've done your PhD, for example. And uh, this is where you start becoming more uh, independent in producing your own research output, maybe you start leading your own uh, research team um, so that um, uh, coming towards the end of your training pathway, uh, you can decide to apply to be um, 
a uh, honorary consultant uh, lecturer um, and uh, start thinking about uh, how to further develop yourself, uh, thinking about uh, running your own lab and these sort of things. Uh, having said all that, this is not a linear pathway. You can enter and exit at any time. Having done an AFP doesn't guarantee you're going to get an ACF. Having not done an AFP doesn't preclude you from getting an ACF, for example, and so on and so forth, moving further on the ladder or up the ladder. Um, and uh, that's kind of that's pretty much it. If anyone has any questions about the uh, integrated academic training pathway, you can message me on the Zoom group chat or you can ask me now if you want. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I, we, I, I had a quick question while Marinos was saying that, and I think it's a really, really good question, a uh, really important one. Some of you might be thinking it as well. Um, so is, do I have to be super passionate about research or education to apply for the AFP? What if I'm semi into research, but not thinking of it as a career choice yet? Really good question. You don't have to be super passionate about an entire career in education, research, leadership, etc. Like I said, the whole point is that it's an introduction to those skills. If you do it and decide you actually, it's not for you, you don't like it, then that's fine. No one expects you to sort of go down this pathway um, and do all these things. So um, not, not, not everyone finishes their academic block and then jumps onto an ACF, et cetera. Um, the whole point is that it gives you protected time to sort of figure out if you like those things or not. Um, if you do, great, carry on. There's a whole pathway there. If you don't, fine, that's okay as well. Hopefully you'll get something tangible out of your F F2 year. You'll get like a presentation or something. You'll meet some really nice people and you carry on with the rest of your training pathway as is. It doesn't matter at all. Um, the point I was making about being passionate about it is more sort of to, in your interviews, selling yourself and actually saying that you're interested in these things. You don't necessarily have to commit to an entire career in those. Does that answer your question? Hopefully, I know I'm babbling a little bit, but um, hopefully that sort of answers your question. Just to, uh, also like maybe to reassure you, like I have no idea if I want to go into research or stuff. I know I definitely want to do a lot of teaching, but all the stuff that I've mentioned to you guys, the research, teaching, leadership, you can do it in a foundation program. It's entirely like you, it's entirely possible to teach people to get something published, present stuff in a normal foundation program. It's just that you have the time and supervision in an academic block. Um, I have no idea if I want to carry on doing research stuff, but I know I do want to do some teaching. That doesn't necessarily mean I have to do an academic clinical teaching job. I can just go through the normal pathway and also like teaching. I thought I'd just um, jump in as well and say, basically just um, echo that as well. I don't really have any intention of following this um, research pathway. And I don't think I really want a research career, but you can't deny that most applications in the future, be it medicine, surgery, GP, there is a component of those applications that look at research um, and teaching. So AFP is just a really good way to make yourself do those things, even if you don't have an intention of building your whole career around it um, afterwards. So, yeah, I completely um, sort of empathise with people who don't want to do research as their whole career. Neither do I. And I didn't apply for an ACF last year when I was applying for IMT training purely because I wasn't ready, I felt at that point, for an ACF. But I felt that my AFP project gave me a lot of skills in which I could talk about at my IMT interview. And that was why I think that was a really big factor in how I got the job I wanted and so on. There is there's also a lot of times when people decide to take a year out to do further research to help um, some F3s aren't just for get low coming or going to Australia. Some people do make connections during their academic block with supervisors and then they get a sort of paid position to just do research for one year. And that again gives them more time to think about whether they want to do it for the rest of their career or not. But you don't need to make any sort of permanent decisions from just your AFP block, especially if it's because it's only for four months or for a few days per 
for a, few, for, for a little bit of time per week for a year. And it's only really a snapshot into academia um, and so on. Perfect. Um, so that was Serena and Angela, uh, two of the other people. Yeah. Oh, Andy, go let, ahead. Sorry. Let me, let me jump in as well. On the other hand, I am seriously considering in applying for like an ACF like next year or the year after next year. So it's, it's just to show the variety of people. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, not everyone follows the same pathway. Some people do AFP and then decide not to uh, do like a formal, not to follow this formal academic training structure. Others um, do so like Marinos, he's on an ACF in cardiothoracics at the moment. So it's, it's very, everyone, everyone just does their own thing as they wish really. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a really good point. I think you maybe don't see it as much when you're at med school, but when you start working, you see a lot of people around you and you'll see, you'll meet 10 consultants and those 10 consultants will have taken a different route to get to where they are. Um, there's so many ways to get to where you want to be. Um, making that decision now isn't, isn't something that you have to do. So don't worry about that too much. Cool. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Again, if anyone has anything to ask, please do. Um, I'm just going to go through some quick, really quick and frequently asked questions in case this sort of preempts things that people are thinking about. So I don't have much research experience. Should I still apply? Yes. So having, having research or teaching or leadership experience can be useful in your interview. But again, I've said it at least 45,000 times webinar. It's just an introduction. The AFP is an introduction to all of these things. You develop a lot of the research skills and experience while you're doing it. You may have experiences that you think are not as strong, but you can still talk about them. So a lot of the stuff that I actually ended up talking about in my interview um, were just sort of like little, like a little audit that I did that literally took one afternoon when I was uh, on clinics, um, bedside teaching, things like that. People think that they need to have like a published point or whatever to show up, uh, at, get an AFP job or um, talk about something at an AFP interview. But actually, one good experience that you can sort of really reflect on um, is what it takes. And that will be enough to show your passion for an AFP job. Having said that, there are some, and an AUOA is basically a, a systemic unit of application or something like that. We'll talk about it next week on our um, application webinar. Um, but it, some of them put more en emphasis on things like research, teaching and leadership experience, and they rank you using points. So, for example, London is one of those deaneries. Um, and again, we'll talk about London, other deaneries, specifically um, in, we'll talk, about the, we'll talk about those in our next session. Um, and yeah, like I said, there are plenty of deaneries that don't, maybe don't look at this at all. And I guess another reassurance, like I, I think all of us know people who had no publications, no publications, maybe no like formal teaching experience that still got AFP jobs. What about my foundation program application? So you still have a foundation program alongside an AFP. You on Oriel, so you'll find out about Oriel um, and the nightmare it is in a few weeks or months. Um, you need to apply for your foundation program before you apply for your AFP, but it's through the same sort of web system. Um, if you accept an AFP offer, you're withdrawn automatically from the foundation program process. So if you accept an academic job, that's it, that's your job. Um, but obviously at that stage where your academic offers come out, you don't know what foundation program, deanery or job you're going to have. So most people do end up accepting their AFP offers because it gives you some sort of solidarity um, in what your next few years is going to look like. Um, if you don't get an offer or you reject an AFP offer, you'll be kept in the foundation program process and then you'll carry on as everyone else is. Is this the only route in academia? Angela's already touched on this. No, not at all. If you don't think the AFP is for you at this stage, hopefully we've done a decent job convincing you that almost everyone should apply. Um, if you still don't think it's for you, you can get back into any of this stuff at any stage. All foundation doctors that I know, all of my colleagues here, do a lot of the stuff that I'm doing alongside their jobs, but it's often time consuming, stressful, unsupported, and it can be quite difficult for them. That's where the AFP is, is such a big bonus, is that it offers all these things. Um, 
Okay, so uh, I've just got I've had a few questions, so I'll just pause there for a second. So we've just had a question that says, what are the cutoffs per deanery? Is that on Oriel? Um, and again, like I said, we'll talk about this more next week. I don't want to focus on it too much now. Um, I think Serena's just started replying to it in the chat as well. She's right. So not many deaneries publish cutoffs um, because a lot of deaneries don't have cutoffs. Places like London have a specific list of points that you can go up and look. We've sent it to you in the newsletter this week. You can go up and look exactly how many points you'll have. The cutoff for London changes every year. I can't predict what it's going to be, but usually it's like 9, 10, 11 out of the sort of point system that they have uh, to rank. Um, don't quote me on that. That might change. Other deaneries might not look at this stuff at all. They might not look at things like presentations, publications, etc. Um, and so we don't really know what goes into that interview selection process necessarily. But what we can do is help you sort of maximize the experiences you and selling yourself to get those interview spots. So the next question was, will I lose out on clinical experience? So technically, yes, you'll you'll have one less placements worth of clinical experience. Like I said before, you'll have to complete all your normal requirements. Um, and you can easily make up that clinical experience by having a day or two a week in your block. I have a friend here at the Royal Free who's on a rheumatology academic block. Um, she does three days a week in clinic and two days a week on research. Um, I have a friend who's on a virology block who does five days a week of medical virology. What that means, I don't know, but he, he does that for five days a week. He's just going to have two months going forward now where he's just going to do solid project work. Um, so there are workarounds around losing that clinical experience. How much autonomy do I have? So this is a big question that we get is, oh, I'm applying to this AFP. I'm ranking academic med ed. I'm ranking OBS and gynae, et cetera, et cetera. What if I get a job that I don't necessarily want or what can I do within that job? Will they just tell me what to do is a question that I get a lot. A lot of it does depend on your supervisor, but the thing to take into account is that a lot of these supervisors sign up to be academic supervisors to foundation trainees so they know that you guys are applying not necessarily wanting to do their specialty but wanting to gain those skills and experience so a lot of the time they're really really flexible most deaneries allocate you a supervisor but in others you might find one. so again there's some flexibility in terms of which department you work with in that case and again some supervisors when you start or before you start will give you a project usually a smaller part of like a PhD project or it, or they might just say to you go crazy what do you want to do um, but again a lot of them like mine will wait until you turn up find out your interests are and then point you in the right direction with that um, there is a lot of flexibility basically to summarize what happens if I get an AFP I want so again I've ranked 50 jobs in London and I actually hate hematology but I've got an academic hematology post what do I do? Do I accept or again, that's a question for well down the line, but it's something to start thinking about now is what would you do if you get a job that you necessarily don't want, which does happen a lot of the time. Um, it's quite common. And again, I'm going to emphasize the fact that you'll just get the skills in any job that you have. So even if you hate hematology and you've got an academic hematology job, you discuss your interests with your supervisor and they'll often be able to find a clinical placement or a research block with another person that they know in the hospital in a specialty you're interested in. So for example, so Marinos, for example, and he, maybe you can talk about this for a bit, but he, his uh, academic F, F2 was in GP, but he actually managed to speak to his supervisor and change it to a cardiology project and ended up doing basically a cardiology AFP. So there's a lot of flexibility once you speak to your supervisors. Um, okay, any questions on anything that I've said there? Yeah, it's about that because it's one of those things that people worry about and get lots of questions about. But, um, in some of the academic units, um, you get a job and that's fine. And then uh, if it's not what you want to do and you tell them, you know, I'm not interested in spending four months in doing a research project in renal medicine, for example, I want to be, um, I don't know, microbiologist, can I... Uh, switch and um, they will try their best to accommodate you. Sometimes it might mean that uh, you have to do some clinical work in renal and um, your research in 
microbiology, for example, or it might mean uh, that they'll let you do some sort of a joint project where you are looking at, uh, I don't know, antimicrobial prophylaxis in trans renal transplant recipients, uh, where you get to do something that's closer to what you want to do, uh, but within the group that you are assigned to. And if you're very lucky, they might say, yeah, okay, if you're not interested in this, you can uh, switch to a different group. But that's not everyone. Not everyone will accommodate that. At the same time, having said that, from what I've heard so far, and from my personal experience, it is uh, possible. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I just muted myself. Um, so we're sort of coming to the end of the bit where I sort of talk at you guys and the others talk at you guys. So I just thought I'd wrap up by sort of giving you an idea of what you might consider doing in the next few weeks. Um, just to have, I mean, the application process and the timelines changed a fair bit this year, which we'll again discuss next week on our webinar. Um, but these are just sort of things to consider over the next few weeks um, if you're thinking about applying. So think about the type of AFP you want. You might want to apply to. So do you like education, research, leadership and management? Um, so have a look at the jobs list, which we sent you on the newsletter and see which ones you're interested in. You can often apply to all three of these within a deanery. So um, you don't have to pick, but it's just something to think about. Think about what specialties you might want to have as part of your rotations, and that will help you start ranking the jobs as well. And think about the location. So like I said, an AFP is just an application is just a second shot at whatever deanery you want to be in. But something to think about is do you want to be in the same hospital for two years or a DGH and then a central site, things like that. Um, pay, can't really do much about this uh, with the AFP, but like I said, you can pick up locum shifts, etc. But if it is important to you, um, if it will make a big difference um, having three to four thousand pounds less in your F2 um in terms of rent etc which obviously is a, is, a, is a factor for almost everyone um it's something to think about um if you know any sort of trainees or afp so obviously you've got sort of the five or six of us our aim is to start putting you guys in touch so when we come on to like our full course and the interview side of things our aim is to start matching your applications and where you guys are applying to afps that we know so between us we probably know 50 60 current afps um, who are all mates with us at medical school. So our aim is to try and match you guys up with these people so they can give you specific advice, specific things that happened at their interview, et cetera, as best as we can. But obviously you can at any point message any of us or email us or whatever and just ask what we're doing, what our experience is like, et cetera. Not what we're doing, that sounds a bit creepy, but what our experience was like. Think about whether you want a day release versus a four month block. So do you want that sort of EBH style two days off a week or would you rather just have a four month chunk um, like I'm doing? Funding. So a lot of um, the websites, again, that we sent you in the newsletter, there's information about the funding for the AFP posts. Um, and then, yeah, just generally, if you have any ideas about your career plans, um, etc., it's good to think about that. But you don't have to have a solid idea of what you want to end up doing. Your actual next steps. So in the short term, uh, essentially have a look at the newsletter we've sent you, um, which has a list of sort of the key documents for applying to the foundation program. So it will just tell you again what I told you today, what a foundation program is, what the application process is of it, and you can have a look at the jobs that are on offer as well. Um, and then long term, and this is all very far off stuff, literally weeks, months in uh, after now, is to start make a list of sort of your achievements, getting things ready for writing white space questions, interviews, et cetera. Um, so this is just the newsletter. I thought I'd just put a slide of it on here just so that um, I could just show you guys again. So we sent this out to everyone on the mailing list. Um, if you haven't got it, then please let us know or sign up to our mailing list. Um, there'll be a link at the end of the webinar, but essentially it's just all links. We've just trawled the internet uh, and found all the links for you guys. So hopefully it saves you a good hour or two of just sitting there, not able to find any of the things. Weirdly, and I don't know why, the deanery sites for the AFPs are like impossible to find everywhere. And it was the same case when I was applying as well. Um, but everything's there for you guys. I thought I'd just spend a minute chatting about our actual course so you guys can find out what we're doing next week, etc. Um, we've got our timeline here. Um, and on the left, you can see um, what the AFP timeline is. So 
the actual application only opens in October the 19th. So you've still got a lot of time and it shuts on November the 4th. So you've got a lot of time for your application um, to get things ready, basically. Um, and on the right here, we've got sort of the things that we'll be doing over the next few months. So the first four weeks of these webinars are going to be completely free. Like I said, our aim is just to let you guys know what an AFP is, try and widen participation, get more people applying to this program because we think it's a great thing to do. So this session was an introduction. Next week, I'm going to spend about half an hour, 45 minutes chatting through the application process. And then we'll share our own experiences of applying what we found great, what was horrible, etc. Serena is going to do the next session after that, which is going to be writing white space questions. And we're going to send you a newsletter beforehand um, with like tips and tricks for actually getting really succinct but high impact white space questions um, to make you stand out. And then we're going to have a week where we just have a general Q&A. Um, I know a lot of people have been messaging everyone privately, but hopefully over the next few weeks, we'll all get to know each other. And hopefully some of the questions that I've answered that I've been sent privately, other people were thinking as well. So it's just a chance for anyone to ask us anything. After this, um, we'll be doing a further eight webinars. So basically from here onwards, we'll be doing a further eight webinars, which we've already sort of designed. Um, and we'll be offering it as like a package for a small fee. Um, right now we're going to be offering it for sort of 30 pounds for all eight weeks, or you can pay for five pounds per webinar. The main reason we're doing this is because we need to cover the costs of things like Zoom, how having a website, a mailing list, things like that. Um, hopefully you guys can see that 30 pounds for eight webinars is basically the price of like a London coffee or a return train journey. So if you guys were going to do these in-person AFP events anyway, then hopefully you can see that we're offering you something, um, that is equivalent in uh, price. Also, it's significantly less money than most other AFP courses out there. There's people doing this stuff for hundreds of pounds. Um, and honestly, you guys don't want to listen to me for hundreds of pounds. So don't worry. Um, you'll get personalized support throughout all of it as well. So all five of us, plus our friends who are current AFPs, we're going to do our best to give you personalized support, offer one-to-one -one mock interviews, white space question checking, etc., while we go along as well. Um, next week's session is going to be on specifics of the application. Uh, I need to learn what an AUOA stands for, but deanery, uh, we're going to talk about deanery specific applications, ranking jobs, the basics of white space questions and things like that. And then we'll talk about London AFPs because again, from our sort of pre questionnaire, a lot of people are applying there. So I'll chat a bit more detail about that as well. Um, comes to the end of like me chatting. Um, over here is a QR code for our mailing list. So if you're not already on it and you want um, the newsletters or you want to be notified about the web, et cetera, then have a scan of that. Um, if you guys could fill out the feedback form on the left, we'd really, really appreciate it. Um, obviously, like this is all fine, but a re it would just be nice to have some feedback from you guys to guide what you thought was good. If you never want to see me again, um, it will hurt, but I'll listen. Um, so just please fill out the feedback form. That'll be really, really useful. Um, and again, in our uh, mailing list, we sent out a sort of pre-course questionnaire, not for our own sort of research or whatever, but it's literally so that we can shape this course. We're a while away from next week, from the week after. So anything you guys want to know, please tell us. We'll do the research, find out, ask our friends and tell you. So please just fill out that questionnaire and this feedback. It'll be really useful. But yeah, thank you. Um, if there's any questions, please chuck a hand up or message us, etc. Um, I don't know if any of the other guys, Marinos, Anthony, Serena, Angela, if you've got anything to say, or if you had any questions privately, you think the group would want to hear, um, then yeah. I'm going to clap for myself in the corner because it feels weird sitting in a room on my own. A um, little bit spooky. It's getting dark outside. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Vic. Um, Thank so, you. does anyone have any questions? Uh, we'll hang around for a few more minutes. Um, okay, so I had one question. Um, and, uh, for me? A, again, a really good question. Um, so, the, fir the first thing was I'm a fifth year student. Should I be thinking about the application or how much should I be thinking about it? Um, and the sort of follow on question to that was when do I actually apply for the AFP? Um, so in terms of when you apply, you, you will apply for your, any of your foundation programs or the academic program in the coming few weeks, if you're in final year. So I know some of you might be fourth year, fifth year, sixth year students listening to this. 
you'll only have to apply when you're in final year. Um, the application timeline is on, um, it's on, like I said, this page. So November 4th, 2020 is when the deadline is if final year. A lot of you, again, are fourth and fifth years uh, that, that might be listening to this. What I would say in answer to, is it too early? When should I start thinking about this stuff? I think it's never too early to start thinking about it. If you're interested in this stuff or you're passionate about it, um, the next few weeks, especially when we sort of talk about what goes into an application, would be quite useful for you guys to come and have a listen to so that you get an idea of what you need to be doing when you get to final year. Those of you who are in final year as well, it's not too late to still do things. You can still go out and teach people and use the next few weeks to get your portfolio ready. Um, so it's definitely not too late to sort of think about applying. I know for a fact, I mean, I have, I have, again, tons of friends who had no sort of formal points or anything, publications, presentations, they just decided to apply and now they're happily in their AFP jobs. Um, I know for myself, I only really found out about the AFP sort of mid or the end of fifth year. Um, and so I only started like looking into stuff around then um, and looking at sort of like the London points list and seeing what I needed to do. Um, and yeah, there were some things that I couldn't do in time, but there are some things I can do. So it's never too early to start, essentially. Um, I would say, yeah, to the fifth years or younger, um, the London points list is a good thing to look at, even though even if you're not applying to London, it will give you an idea of the things you can do between now and the applications. Cool. Uh, any other questions, anyone? We'll hang around for a few minutes. So if you want to wait until it's just the five of us and have a really intimate Q&A session, then we can do that. <laughs> well, everyone is a bit shy. It's the first time. That's all right. Um, uh, I think some of the future sessions will have to be a bit more interactive for them to work. Uh, so we'll get you talking then. Oh, we've got someone's turn on their camera. Hi, hi, Sarah. <laughs> I just hi, showed Sarah. your face, or did you want to say something? Hi, Sarah. Was no, that an okay, accident? All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> it was really helpful. Right, right, right next to the fire exit as well. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh also for those of you that are still here i should say um we've recorded this and if you want to watch it back um with the slides and stuff um we'll chuck it up and send it out on the mailing list message to put on some music uh <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Uh, I actually have to go. So, Marinos, can you sing for us? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. All right. Cheers, Serena. Um, we have one more question here. So, for the London AFP, it says 10 points for additional degrees. How does that work to get 10 points? Great question. Um, it basically means, from what I remember, it basically means that you need to have two PhDs, essentially, to get the 10 points. Um, it doesn't make much sense to me, but the reason that they do that and make it out of 10 is in case people have more than one sort of postgraduate degree. So if people have a BSc and an MSc or a PhD and a BSc, it means they can add it up. I don't think it's possible to get the 10 points unless someone has two PhDs, but if someone has two PhDs, I don't know necessarily why they're doing an academic program unless it's for things like teaching leadership and management etc um hopefully that answers your question i don't yeah i mean yeah i wouldn't worry too much about that i think the vast majority of people who are applying will have potentially a bsc degree um and that will be a first a two one a two two uh, um and again i know people who didn't do intercalated years or bscs and it was fine
Hi, um, Sarah here. I was just wondering in terms of uh, clinical questions in the AFP interviews, is that something all deaneries do? Or is that only a London AFP thing? Less so again, than oh yeah, go on, sorry. Not, not all deaneries, but I think the majority do. Um, Leicester, uh, North, North, Northampton, no, Leicester, Nottingham and Rutgers and LNR Deanery didn't ask for clinical um, scenarios but they did ask for a personal um, there was a personal station and a um, critical appraisal one so it, I suppose if you're applying for two probably one of them will have it so it's best to prepare and also it's really good revision for OSCEs. Yeah exactly like, I, like the, the clinical stuff was I mean that, that's probably the easier part of the interview versus the critical appraisal and the um personal stuff because it is basically just sort of finals revision for the most part um it's, it works quite well um i yeah london i got asked um uh, i had a whole, like 10 15 minute station on clinical and cambridge they gave me sort of a veiled clinical scenario like it started off as like a critical appraisal thing and then went into a scenario um which i got horrendously wrong um but again we'll talk about that later in the next few weeks Okay, thanks. Uh, Serena's gone as well, but her EBH um, interview had no clinical in it at all. It was entirely personal. So some deaneries will, some deaneries won't. Cool. Okay, guys. Um, I think. If anyone has any questions, we'll be on for another minute, but then after that, we'll be doing the chat. So get your questions in now or ask us on Facebook or email. All right, guys, we're going to start uh, kicking people out of the chat. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Um, goodbye. Hopefully see you next week.